Good afternoon. Uh, just an announcement that um, this, the syllabus um, has been adjusted online, but the last class is um, April 16th, not the 23rd. So the law school ends um, before the uh, Harvard College. And so because of that, um, we'll, our last class will be on uh, April 16th. Uh, and so uh, we have just a, a few more weeks. Uh, and next week, uh, there's no reading, so um, we will discuss the, um, uh, essentially the, the, the attempt or the opportunity from moving from low energy to high energy democracy. So these last weeks of the course are oriented to the programmatic discussion, the discussion about the future and the American alternatives. And I want to remind you before we begin that the premise all along is that there is a, a two-sided relation, a reciprocal dialectical relation between the interpretation of American experience and the imagination of the American alternative. And it goes both ways. It's not just that the interpretation of the experience informs the imagination of alternatives in the country. It's also that the imagination of alternatives is part of the premise of the assumption of the interpretation of the experience. To understand anything, to understand the historical experience, is to understand what it can become, what it can be turned into. Uh, and that's why all along, in every stage of the argument, we've been trying to combine the interpretive and the programmatic. Now, what I'm going to do in provoking the discussion about the first focus, which is the democratization of the market, uh, and for and emphasizing structural alternatives, institutional alternatives, on, in three focal points. The relation of the advanced part of production, the vanguard of production, now the knowledge economy, to the rest. The relation of labor to capital and the relation of finance to the real economy. And those together compose the essential structural content of a productivist alternative in American democracy today. Uh, next week, we're going to turn to the deepening of democracy as the counterpart to the democratization of the market. And the week after that, then, to the transformation of education and of culture. Now, I actually want to begin one step before with a, method, a, a brief methodological discussion of the difficulties of programmatic argument today and of what explains these difficulties and the relation of the American alternative to these perplexities. And here I'm returning to ideas brought up much earlier in the course. So if today I propose to you something very different, very far away from what exists, you are likely to respond, that's interesting, but it's utopian. If I propose something close to what exists, you're going to say, that may be feasible, but it's trivial. And so it is that in the current climate of opinion in the world, in the whole world, not just in the United States, almost anything that can be proposed is likely to be dismissed as either utopian or trivial. Now, the first thing to say is that this idea of a dilemma of utopianism or triviality results from a misunderstanding of the nature of a programmatic argument or of transformative practice. A programmatic argument is not about blueprints. It's about successions of steps. 
It's not like architecture, it's like music. And any succession worth thinking about can be explored at points relatively close to what exists or relatively far away from what exists. In this situation here, in this academic situation, my tendency is to prefer an intermediate level of distance uh, from the existing, neither very close nor very far away. And the reason is that this intermediate level uh, is useful to conceptual clarification. That's the reason for the preference of the intermediate level, of the middle distance. But in politics, and in the exercise of political prophecy, we tend to avoid the middle distance because the middle distance is likely to be not close enough to the existent to seem feasible and not far enough away from the existent to arouse enthusiasm. And that is why in the conduct of political prophecy or in the discourse of politics, we are more likely to prefer the combination of the very close to the very distant. And that's why the discourse of political prophecy and the imagination of alternatives ordinarily seeks to combine the practical with the prophetic. Now, I say all of this by way of uh, urging you to make a correction for what I said. Uh, I'm going to describe situations at a middle distance from the existent, and I want you in your imagination to collaborate with me by correcting my statements and imagining, imagining these alternatives projected forward to the existent and further away to the visionary. But there's another source of difficulty which is of special interest. And the other source of difficulty results from the consequences of our intellectual history, the history of ideas about society and its transformation. And especially the history of regimes, of the idea of regimes. The problem is this. Uh, we today have no usable and credible theory of regimes and of regime change. No theory of how the framework of social life changes discontinuously and is remade. Marxism, Marxist theory of society and history, was the most powerful influence on the evolution of the ideas of the left with its characteristic ideas that the structure of society is a human artifact, it's something that we made and that we imagine and therefore can remake and reimagine. But this revolutionary insight into the made up character of social life, that the structure of society is an artifact and that we can hope to understand it because we made it, even though we made it collectively, this revolutionary insight in the history of social theory was circumscribed and in a way corrupted by a series of illusions. The illusion that there's a closed list of regimes, what Marx calls them, the, the modes of production, slave society, capitalism, then socialism, the theory that each of these regimes is an indivisible system, which when it changes, changes all at once. And the idea that there are laws, historical laws, governing the foreordained succession of these systems in history. None of those assumptions is credible today. And that is why uh, almost no one believes in the heroic version of Marxist theory, but those who disbelieve in it very often continue to use the vocabulary of the theory, 
even though the words, the terms, only have a clear meaning in the context of these theoretical assumptions. So that's our confusion. We talk about capitalism. We rely on this binary idea of politics. We either have reformist management of a system or the revolutionary substitution of one system by another. We think that there, we, we talk as if there were laws, as if history had a project for us, when in reality history has no project for us. We have only the projects that we assign to ourselves. And because we have no usable and credible way of thinking about regimes and their transformation, we fall back on a bastardized conception of political realism, which is that a proposal is realistic if it comes close to what already exists. Now, obviously, this is not a criterion of political realism. This is like just a declaration of intellectual bankruptcy. We have no way of thinking about regimes or regime change, and so we think whatever is close to what exists is what's realistic, what's far from what exists not realistic. And that helps explain this false dilemma of the trivial and the utopian that haunts and threatens to paralyze the programmatic imagination. Now, the particular line of ideas about alternatives, economic, political, and cultural, which we are going to explore in these last few classes, is all very closely related to a conception that has enormous importance in American history. We explored it when we spoke about the message of the American prophets. The central theme is not equality, contrary to what Tocqueville argued. The central theme is freedom, empowerment, <coughs> emancipation. The raising up of the life of the ordinary man and woman to a higher level of scope, intensity, and capability. As if the ordinary human being could increase his or her quota in the divine attribute of transcendence. In the United States, this prophetic idea, this idea of our vocation to transcend, to become bigger, to aspire to a shared bigness. This idea has always risked being, being corrupted in two ways. First, by an inadequate account of the relation between self-fashioning and solidarity. So the impulse in the United States has been to imagine that first the individual becomes bigger, and then as a result of becoming bigger, he becomes generous. Uh, as if generosity were an afterthought to empowerment. The individual, is a little, as I said in an earlier class, a little Napoleon who crowns himself. And then we have the political theory of the little Napoleon. But that's not how it is. Solidarity is internal to self-construction. It's a moment in self-construction. It's not an afterthought. It's not a reward for our empowerment. It's part of our empowerment. And the second taint on this idea of our greatness, our vocation to become bigger together, uh, is institutional idolatry. The notion that the American people discovered at the time of the foundation of their republic the definitive formula of a free society, and that the rest of humanity must either subscribe to this formula or continue to languish in poverty and despotism. So the premise of all of these programmatic arguments is the attempt to rescue the prophetic message from these two perversions. The perversion of 
a disturbed understanding of the relation between solidarity and self-destruction, and the perversion of the institutional ideology. Now let me stop there for a moment, and John, would you like to say anything to comment on this methodological introduction, or you, the class? Does anyone want to make a statement or ask a question? All right. So <clears throat> I'm going to focus now on the first large theme, which is the democratization of the market order. The premise is a premise which was laboriously established in legal thought from the middle of the 19th century to the end of the 20th century, and which is the exact opposite of what you could call market fundamentalism. Market fundamentalism is the idea that a market economy has a single natural and necessary form. What the jurists discovered often unwillingly against their original intentions is that there is no single natural and necessary form of a market. <coughs> and that a market order can be organized in radically different ways with decisive consequences, not just for the distribution of economic advantage and disadvantage, but also for the organization of production and exchange. But of course, this is, not the, this is not the theme. This structural theme is not the organizing theme of most of progressive discourse in the United States or in the other contemporary societies. The dominant theme of the established discourse is that there is a market. The market is a tremendous engine for the creation of wealth. Unfortunately, it also generates inequalities and we come after the fact and correct these inequalities. So the central theme of the progressive orthodoxy is compensatory redistribution through tax and transfer, through progressive taxation and redistributive social entitlements. So I, so I want to begin by saying something about this theme, the theme of the progressive orthodoxy given that the main focus is something else. The main focus is structural change. But what does this focus of structural change imply for the discussion of the major concern of the progressives in the contemporary societies and clearly in the United States? Now, I want to summarize a position schematically my three propositions that are in a hierarchical order. The first proposition is that what matters for the distribution of advantage and disadvantage is overwhelmingly the structure, the institutional organization of the economy, which shapes the primary distribution of advantage and disadvantage. Of economic and educational opportunity or lack of opportunity. Everything that we can create later through retrospective redistribution shaping a secondary distribution is much less important. Now let me explain why this is so. The market and any market order comes with its established arrangements and incentives, including the incentives to save, to invest and, and to employ. If the inequalities generated by the market order are enormous and anchored in the hierarchical segmentation of the production system, the compensatory redistribution would also have to be massive. So massive that long before it reached the requisite dimension to correct the inequalities, it would begin to disorganize the economy and exact an unacceptable cost in lost output or loss in the enhancement of productivity. 
And that's why the corrective redistribution can never be more than an improvement or an enhancement of what we seek to achieve by the institutions that, the estab that established the original or the primary distribution. This tension, this problem, is captured in the familiar rhetorical apparatus of the tension between equity and efficiency. And that's the reason why much more important than compensatory redistribution is always institutional change influencing the primary distribution. Now I come to my second principle, going down the hierarchy of principles. And that doesn't mean that there is no role for compensatory redistribution. And particularly, there is a role that is highlighted by what has been the greatest historical achievement of European social democracy, which is, after all, the most admired economic model in the world, much more widely admired than the economic model established in the United States. The, the special significance of compensatory redistribution takes place when the compensatory redistribution is, has as its goal to increase the, to invest in people and in their capabilities. That's the greatest historical achievement of European social democracy, which it achieved paradoxically by relying on the regressive and indirect taxation of consumption. Here is then the proposition that I want to defend as my second principle with respect to compensatory redistribution. If you take the budget and you have in mind both the revenue raising side and the spending side, what matters most in the short term is not the progressive profile of taxation, the progressive profile of the revenue raising side of the budget. What matters is the aggregate level of the tax take and how it is spent. So if we compare the tax systems of the United States and the European social democracies, we discover a startling paradox. The United States is by far the most unequal of the rich industrial democracies. But on paper, it has the relatively more progressive tax system because it gives pride in place to the progressive taxation of personal income. The European systems are much more egalitarian in their ultimate effect, but they rely heavily on the regressive tax of consumption through the comprehensive flat rate value added tax or some functional equivalent to it. How are we to explain this paradox? So, the basic reason why the European budgetary systems are on the whole more progressive than the American, despite their reliance on the regressive and indirect taxation of consumption, is that the European social democracies take in at least 10% of GDP more as tax take than the United States. And what they, what they lose by way of progressivity on the revenue raising side of the budget, they gain in double on the spending side. That's the basic reason. Now, why are they able to take in more tax without paying the heavy economic price that would be paid if the tax were taken to a directly redistributive form? What is the comprehensive flat rate value added tax? You can imagine it as in the following way. Take the economy as a vast input-output table, the transformation of every input into an output, 
this tax takes a constant proportion of the value of the transformation of every input into an output. And it therefore is, if its perfect neutrality is preserved, neutral with respect to the system of relative prices. Its neutrality with respect to the system of relative prices enables it to increase the tax take while diminishing the economic trauma, the disorganization of the economy that would result from a directly redistributed tax. So by relying on a tax that is, after all, regressive, the Europeans are able to take in more by way of tax take, and then they spend on the spending side of the budget in a redistributive way, and in particular, they spend by investing in a high level of public services, especially health and education for their citizens. So no right-wing government in Europe since the Second World War has even attempted significantly to reduce the tax base because this reliance on a high level of taxation for the sake of a high level of social investment has come to be seen in the European social democracies as part of a social contract which the populations of the European social democracies are unwilling to give up independently of their political or ideological position. The income tax, on the other hand, is a directly, on its face, a directly redistributed tax, which does not have this neutrality. Now, the American politicians at election time all feign devotion to progressive taxation. <laughs> even though they know, or should know, and in some cases I know that they know, that this tax has an entirely marginal effect on redistribution. And why do they do this? They do this symbolically as a way of showing whose side they're on, even though they know that it's, it has no effect, no adequate effect. So in other words, they prefer progressive pieties to transformative consequences. Uh, and this is then my second principle. Uh, now let's go down one more step in this argument to the third principle in the hierarchical order of the principles. The third principle is that once we have organized the tax system around the taxation of consumption, through the avowedly regressive tax, comprehensive flat rate value add tax, or some set of functional equivalents to it, it's easy to add a directly redistributive element if we want to. Direct redistributive taxation has in principle two main targets. One target is the hierarchy of standards of living what the individual spends on himself, his individualized consumption. And the second target is the accumulation and exercise of economic power. Because after all, independently of what you spend on yourself, one of the consequences of wealth is that through accumulation you have economic power to control the labor of other people. Now, the exercise of economic power is a target much harder to reap through the tax system because it depends on the totality of the institutional arrangements of the market order. But the best way to reach it, to the extent that it can be reached, is at the moment of death. And therefore, uh, the most successful way to reach that target of economic power is through a confiscatory inheritance tax or the equivalent in the taxation of gifts inter vivos in the family. The second target of direct redistributive taxation is the hierarchy of standards of living. And the theory of this tax 
of a tax on individualized consumption was developed initially by one of Keynes's disciples, Nicholas Caldor, and expounded in his book, An Expenditure Tax, published in 1954, just a few years after the end of the Second World War. And this tax functions in the following way. You take the aggregate income of the individual, not just labor income, but also capital income, and you subtract from the aggregate income the invested savings. Uh, because that difference between aggregate income and invested savings is what the individual spends on himself in his standard of living. And that's what's going to be taxed. And that can then be taxed on a steeply progressive slope. So if the individual lives beneath a certain level of standard of living, you might say he pays nothing, he receives. That's what the, um, the Americans call the negative income tax. As you go up the hierarchy of standards of living, he pays more on a steeply progressive slope. And at the top, for luxury living, the sky is the limit. So the income tax, the maximum rate is 100%. But the Caldor tax, that's what this tax is called among experts, is the top rate is as much as you want. The only limit is political will and political power. You could say the top rate is 500%. For every dollar you spend on yourself, you pay five to the government. This tax has no technical difficulties of administration other than the difficulties of the income tax. So if the progressives were both lucid and sincere in their profession of redistributive faith, this is the tax that they would prefer, and not the income tax. The income tax is a blunt instrument. It hits neither of these two targets squarely, and it is functionally, in most of the world, a tax on the wages of the middle class. In principle, rich people don't pay income tax. They have many ways of evading income tax. So it's a stupid tax. Uh, but this is the tax that the progressives prefer in the United States as in most of the world. So those are the three propositions that say how someone who does not believe in the primacy of compensatory redistribution would nevertheless have a position with respect to the agenda of compensatory redistribution. Now, once again, I stop and ask for your comments and criticisms of these statements. Yes? Wouldn't the rich just come up with ways of evading the Caldor tax? Speak louder, please. I'm like, compared to like strengthening implementation of the income tax, or would it really be administratively easier to set up this whole new Caldor tax? Because wouldn't the rich then just find ways to evade that? Too? It's a declaratory tax, like the income tax and it has no difficulties of administration other than the income tax. Because what you cannot demonstrate as invested saving counts as if it had been spent. So you have to demonstrate invested saving, and the, t and the tax falls then on the difference between total income, income to labor and income to capital, and invested saving. That's what you spend on yourself. <clears throat> yes? Um, what incentives do progressive politicians or pro redistribution politicians have to like, you know, raise uh, income tax or come up or implement the Caldor tax if they can pass? Like, Why? Uh, what incentives do progressive politicians have to implement the Caldor tax um, if they can just like, buy a program by like, the deficit and increase the if they can, If they can buy a program using the deficit increasing the national debt? Well, this is another subject, right? Of, uh, to what extent can the debt be monetized? And, uh, and this is the debate uh, that goes under the label of modern monetary theory, that the printing of money can be used or the functional equivalent to it as an alternative. I think this is a complete illusion. So, at 
it's easier to understand the problem uh, uh, not in the United States, but around the world, in developing countries. So, for example, there's this debate in the world about fiscal austerity. And a common position of the conservatives in this debate is that the way to develop a country is to win financial confidence. You win the confidence of the financial markets, and then that will somehow produce a flow of foreign investment, and that will drive economic growth. Uh, now, it's completely false, because no country in modern history has developed by charming the capital markets. It's never happened. It didn't happen in American history. Uh, the Americans never did that. So it's outrageous that they recommend that now to the rest of the world when they themselves never followed that policy. Uh, the country, in, in the religion of finance, of financial orthodoxy, matters only in the very short term. What matters in the medium to the long term is economic reality. The reality of economic growth and the opportunities for profit that it generates. So what has been in the recent historical period the main destination of foreign investment capital has been China. And China has defied every element of the religion of finance because it has succeeded in establishing growth. Now, in the short term, uh, the, the Keynesians would say, you don't have to pay attention to saving. And uh, because saving, according to Keynes, is more the consequence of growth than the cause or condition of growth. And if you extend that idea of vulgar Keynesian get something like modern monetary theory, and you, need, you can just print it. You can create this money. Uh, now, this fails to take into account the reality of constraint in the beginning of a process of national development. So the general principle is that in history, rebellion is not always rewarded. But obedience is invariably punished. So if, if a country uh, wants to rebel, to establish a rebellious strategy of economic growth, it has to acquire the instruments to resist. It has to be able to say no to the capital markets uh, in the initial stages of making the strategy, of creating the strategy of development. And this need then can mean that it has to save, it has to have a war chest, it has to have foreign reserves, and the, the, the need to create the, base, the basis for a defensive rebellion, a fiscal seal of national rebellion, trumps the arguments in favor of the Keynesian counter-cyclical management in the economy. So what you could say is that in the early stages of a process of national development, a country should sacrifice, it should be austere, it should balance the book, it should balance the books, it should create a huge reserve of hard foreign currency, even with tremendous sacrifice. Not in order to win the confidence of the financial markets, but for the exact opposite reason so as not to depend on the confidence of the financial markets. Uh, and that's the reality that I want to contrast to the illusions of modern monetary theory. And that's what these rebellious economies have in fact done. Now when we come and apply this lesson to the United States, it's more complicated because the dollar is still the reserve currency of the world, even though the large developing countries are now trying to thrown it. Uh, and that complicates this uh, equation and gives the United States more options than it would otherwise have. But the general principle remains that 
there isn't this free lunch that is imagined that uh, national sovereignty is expensive and it requires a country, especially in the initial st stages or steps of its process of national rebellion to sacrifice. To sacrifice so that it can then be heretical as China was and so they can then develop a strategy of economic growth that will produce real growth and the real opportunities for profit that will then, among other things, attract foreign capital. Yes? Uh, so my question is about charming the financial market. Yes. Um, I'm curious to hear your view on the notion that SEC's robust um, regulation over the stock market really helped the U.S being the center stage for the, the world capital market and also helped attracting foreign investment for the country. But what's the number of the question there? Is, is that, so of course regulation, of, uh, it, it's good to have a regulatory apparatus that doesn't allow the incumbents in the market for corporate control to run roughshod over the challenger. That's good, and that would still be good in any of these heretical paths that I'm describing. So this is, in no way is this an argument to lessen the regulatory burden. Was, was, was that your question? Um, so my question is more of like, so um, you mentioned that no way in history that any country has charmed the capital market no, um, countries have attempted to charm the capital markets. What I said is that no country has grown, has had a growth miracle simply because it has charmed the capital markets. Uh, that, that it's never happened that way. That a country has to create the mechanisms, the shield that allows it to rebel and part of the shield is fiscal sacrifice. So I would say it's closer, the closest thing in American history to what you showed the way is the war economy example, which the Americans <coughs> forget. And we describe this, the third stage of the Long New Deal when the Americans rejected all of their economic dogmas as if they were just a mask and ran the economy on completely different principles with very high level of taxation and a fluid collaboration between public and private. Completely different from the way in which they ordinarily managed the economy. And in four years, they more than doubled GDP. It had never happened in the United States or anywhere else with a sensational outcome. That's an example, so what, would one, what one might say would be the objective stated in polemical and provocative terms? Let's have a war economy without a war. That's the objective. But it's hard in peacetime to evoke the spirit of sacrifice and of devotion to the nation which the war brings. Yes. Uh, Professor, my question is on the uh, nature of the capital acquisition trade. So, uh, why it is definitely. Uh, yeah, so could, could you start over? Um, could you repeat what you're beginning? Uh, my question is on the Calder Bank, as uh -huh. we just discussed. Uh -huh. Why uh, I understand it is extremely beneficial from a redistributive point of view, uh, from the government's point of view. Yes. Uh -huh. I was wondering if it, if the top rate is the sky, you even mentioned sky's the limit. Sky's the limit. Would it not disincentivize somebody who wants to create wealth to move to the, I mean, would, would we not be disincentivizing that? I said the purpose was not seriously to argue to say we should tax luxury consumption at 500%. 
It's to say that if, there's, if, the, if this is what they really want, this is the way to do it. And not to, not to have this tax that is a tax on the wages of the middle class, the income tax. So that's just a confusion. Uh, and there's no reason for this confusion because a seriously progressive politics has to have a pedagogic dimension. The task of the statesman is to educate the people, to explain this. I mean, it's a little complicated, it's paradoxical. The regressive is progressive, the progressive is regressive. Uh, but it can be explained. I explained it here. Uh, and I think, it's, and anyone should be able to understand this. It's not so complicated. Uh, it doesn't mean that you should do this, but I'm saying that the basic thrust is, is attempting to change the primary distribution through institutional reconstruction. But it can be extended. So the compensatory redistribution then has an adjuvant, an accessory character that enhances or extends the direction of what you try to achieve by the primary means of institutional reconstruction. That would be the direction that I would recommend to the progressives in the United States or anywhere else. Now, shall we go on then yes, to the, yes, yes. so let's go on to the real thing, <coughs> because I, this discussion uh, is, is a genuflection to the concerns of the progressives with compensatory redistribution, which I regard as a sideshow. So, the real thing is the structure. Mm -hmm. And in the structure, there are three large themes. And let me begin with the primary theme, which is the relation of the vanguard to the rest of the economy. So in every historical period, there is a, there is a most advanced part of production. Our, our conception of what makes the most advanced part of production most advanced keeps changing in the course of economic history. And one way in which we can think of it today is to say the most advanced part of production, the most advanced sector of production, is the sector that's closest to the imagination. Karl Marx and Adam Smith, the two greatest economists in the history of economics, both thought that the best way to understand the economy and its transformative possibilities was to study the most advanced sector of production in the historical circumstance. They thought that because they believed that the most advanced sector of production is the sector that most fully reveals our human powers. That's why you study it. Now, what's the situation today? Up to the end of the 20th century, there was the most advanced part of production was what we call Fordist mass production. We just discussed right. Henry Ford right. last week. Right. And he was the apostle of this mass version of, of mass, mass production. Mass production. Right. It was the large scale production of standardized goods and services with relatively rigid machines and production processes on the basis of semi-skilled labor and very hierarchical and specialized relations of production. This was mass production. The message of development economics up to the closing decades of the 20th century was there's a shortcut to economic growth, unconditional convergence to the richest economies. The shortcut was conventional industry for this mass production. And the reason was that for this mass production, this was then the message of development economics, was like, it's like a kit right. with a highly stereotyped set of machines and production processes that, as if you could put down an airplane and take it anywhere right. and land it. And then the message was, transfer workers and resources from the less productive sectors to the more productive sectors. Meaning in practice, 
transfer them from agriculture to industry, to conventional industry. Now, the development economists always recognized that this shortcut depended on what they call the fundamentals. And there were two fundamentals, institutions and education. But the fundamentals were also very lax or lenient. So all that was required by way of institutions was a mixed market economy with the state together with the private order that gave a place in the government bureaucracy for the development economists. That's what they required and considered institutionally necessary. And education, there was lift service paid to education. The workers have to be educated, a, a big lie. The workers in a Fordish factory didn't have to be educated. They had to have numerical and verbal literacy. And physical dexterity. Yeah, to be able to understand instructions, numerical and verbal instructions. They had to have a disposition to obey, yeah. and they had to have manual dexterity, especially in the form of hand-eye coordination. Right. That's all that they needed to have. And then you would, you would take this stereotype kit with its minimalist presuppositions, and you could take it anywhere in the world, and one country after another would industrialize through import substituting industrialization. That was the shortcut to economic growth. Now this shortcut has stopped working, and one country after another is deindustrializing. One of those countries is the United States, and uh, that's the Rust Belt Industries. Right. So this former vanguard of production now survives as the vestige of an earlier vanguard or as the satellite to the new vanguard, which is what we call the knowledge economy. And thus a new dilemma about economic growth or development arises in the world, which is the following. The old path to economic growth has stopped working little by little. But the new path, which would be a broad-based, socially inclusive form of the new vanguard of the knowledge economy, seems inaccessible. It doesn't exist. Even in the most advanced economies, the United States, Germany, Japan, or you could add now China and India, it doesn't exist in them. How can it exist in the rest of the world? That's a dilemma. And this dilemma, if it can be broken, can be broken only on the second side. That is, there's no way in which conventional industry can be brought back to life. All you can do is buy a few more years for it through negative defensive measures, restraints on plant closing, subsidies, uh, limitations to offshoring, yes. So given that you know American manufacturing output has actually increased over the past four or three decades or so, but the amount of people employed in manufacturing has declined substantially, can we really talk about sort of like this transition to the knowledge economy and sort of deindustrialization given that industrial output is still being produced in America? But no, sort of well, it's to? a different form of industry that would yeah. be, of course it would be. But now comes the question then, what is this new vanguard, which to the extent that it exists, exists only in the insular form? Right? What is the knowledge economy? And then now I want to be extremely summary. So in the United States, the tendency is to identify the knowledge economy with the platform oligopolies of Silicon Valley. In fact, these platform oligopolies are an anomalous corner of the knowledge economy with very special characteristics. So the universal platforms that depend for their social as well as their economic value on the universality of the platform. That's why there's a, a limitation in using antitrust because antitrust would destroy the universality of the platform and that would be a prejudice to all of society and not just to the owners. Uh, 
very large companies with huge pools of liquid capital that are able to absorb the large fixed costs of the internalization of this technology, and near zero marginal cost of the addition of any new customer or client to the platform. And there's a fourth characteristic, which is a surprising accident that arises from a lacuna, from a gap in the law of intellectual properties. The entrepreneurs of these platforms discovered a way to make a business out of the non-protection, the non-legal excludability of the data of their customers, which is their, one of their main assets. They have found a way to develop a business in the uncompensated data of their customers. Uh -huh. So the combination of these characteristics makes this an anomaly. And the profits that arise from this anomaly are what the economists used to call a rent. This is a rent that they have, being able to exploit this marriage of these particular characteristics. That's not the general characteristic of the knowledge economy. The knowledge economy exists in every sector of production now, in intellectually dense services, and even in precision or scientific agriculture. But in each sector, it appears as an insular fringe, excluding the vast majority of firms and of workers. This is the characteristic of, this, of the knowledge economy. So how will we understand its nature? At the superficial level of production engineering or the technical division of labor, it combines the ability to destandardize the production of goods and services with production at scale. Before, up to the end of the 20th century, there was mass production, Fordism, and there was craft production. Craft production was destandardized and had no scale. The scale production has no destandardization. Now you're able to do both. And the second technical characteristic you can understand by analogy to the distinction between a traditional infantry brigade and a guerrilla operation of special forces. There's a radical decentralization of initiative combined with the preservation of momentum and coherence in the process of production. Those are the superficial characteristics. But what are the deeper characteristics? The deeper characteristics are only suggested by this insular form of the knowledge economy. Because a practice of production reveals its potential only as it begins to spread throughout the economy. <clears throat> so the deeper characteristics are first, a heightening of the level of discretionary initiative and of reciprocal trust allowed and required of all participants in the process of production. So conventional industry was a command and control form of production. The market economy itself, the market order in that historical period could be described as a simplified form of cooperation among strangers that is unnecessary when there is high trust and impossible when there is no trust. And now we have, with this new form of production, a heightening of the level of the trust that is necessary from all participants in the process of production. The second characteristic is that this vanguard, this new productive activity, brings closer together the activity of producing and of imagining. So, the, the, the best firms become more like the best schools. The process of production becomes more like the process of the development of experimental science. For example, in additive manufacturing, 3D industry, you have a conception, you immediately materialize the conception, you give it a material form, 
and the materialization suggests a revision of the conception, and you go back and forth between your conjecture and its materialization. Uh, and that's an acceleration of the process of production, productive experimentalism. So the transformation of our relation to technology, which leads to the following thought. What is technology in this new era um, the knowledge economy. Everything that we have learned how to repeat, we can express in a formula or an algorithm. And then we can embody the formula or the algorithm in a mechanical device. The point of the machine is to do for us what we have learned how to repeat so that we can reserve our supreme resource, our time, for the not yet repeatable. And then we have this idea that technology will always, to some extent, replace labor. But the crucial question is whether, in addition to replacing labor, it also enhances labor. And then the relation between the machine, the algorithmic machine without imagination, mm -hmm. and the human being with imagination becomes much more powerful than the machine or the human being alone. Now, the third deeper characteristic of the knowledge economy has to do with the most constant and universal regularity in economic life, which is the so-called law um, declining marginal return. And it can be ex exposed this way. Hold the inputs to a process of production constant. Increase one input. Then, characteristically, the returns to that input will rise, plateau, and then fall at the margin. The pre-classical economists, before the rise of marginalism and the end of the 19th were fascinated and perplexed by this phenomenon of decreasing marginal returns, that they weren't able to understand it. The marginalists derived it as a pseudo-logical inference from their presumption of constant returns to scale. So let me explain. Constant returns to scale means is simply a defeasible factual assumption. So you hold the inputs to a, a process of production constant. You assume that they're constant unless stated otherwise. That's constant returns to scale. Now, constant returns to scale is a factual assumption that is constantly negated in practical experience. There's no reason for it. It has the same role as constant motion in Newtonian mechanics. It's what you assume until you assume something else. Uh, and so what the marginalist said was the law of declining marginal returns is a consequence of constant returns to scale. So they took something which was not a law, which was just a defeasible factual presumption, and they inferred from it the closest thing that economics has to a law. It's completely illogical, because declining marginal returns is a law. If anything, it's in economics. Constant returns to scale is not a law. So they said, if there were not declining marginal returns, this presumption of constant returns to scale would be violated because if the returns at the margin fail to decline, there would be no constant returns of scale. But there's no reason for constant returns of scale. A larger factory can be either more efficient or less efficient than a smaller factory, and all the time in economic life, this departure from constant returns of scale occurs, in fact. So the explanation for the law of diminishing marginal has to be found somewhere else. And I think where it has to be found is in 
the continuous or discontinuous character of innovation. If innovation is discontinuous, there'll be an innovation. The innovation then is the new input and it produces an effect and the effect is eventually exhausted until there's another innovation. But to the extent that the process of innovation becomes internal to production, rather than simply imported into the productive system from the independent evolution of technology and science, and therefore also becomes constant rather than discontinuous, there's more of a chance of lifting or negating this law of diminishing marginal returns. Is that clear for everyone? That's very, that's complicated. <laughs> it's not so simple. Yeah, that's why I asked. Simple, but I think it's simply to suggest, I think the important point to capture is that uh, among the promise of the knowledge economy is the promise of a radical advance in productivity. Yes. Now, the major growth theorist of the late 20th century, Robert Solo here at MIT, is famous for his quip that the computer revolution is everywhere except in the productivity statistics. And that there was no there is, there's no fundamental transformation of productivity. Uh, and you could say that that happened because it had not, in fact, been generalized and internalized right. the way it right. is now. Right. And one of the characteristics of the knowledge economy is a relativization or an effacement of the distinctions among sectors. So, for example, advanced manufacturing consists largely in combined and crystallized intellectual services. The distinction between services and manufacture begins to crumble. Right. And the whole distinction among sectors. So now we have this paradox of the new vanguard. The new vanguard is multi-sectoral. It's in every part of the production system. But at the same time, it's insular. In each part of the production system, it appears as a fringe, excluding the vast majority of workers and employers. And this insular character of the new vanguard has faithful consequences for society, and especially two sets of consequences. Economic slowdown, and the aggravation of economic inequality. Now, slow down. There's a discourse in the United States that goes under the label of secular stagnation, which is a phrase from the 1930s of Alvin Hansen, which tries to cast a halo of naturalness on this slowdown or economic slowdown. So there was a rise of productivity in the United States in the 30 years after the Second World War. Then there was an ephemeral spike in productivity between 1995 and 2004, which is attributed to the one-time incorporation of the new technologies into large businesses. For example, Walmart is not a firm in the knowledge economy, but it used the technologies of the knowledge economy to achieve an advance in its management of its data and information. Right. right. Uh, so and that then accounts for this one-time spike. Right. And in fact, some people now see it as part of the knowledge economy because of what you just said. So uh, economic slowdown then we could we could re-describe or re-explain as the consequence of this insularity of the knowledge economy. So if we deny the most advanced practice to the great majority of workers and firms, how could there not be slowdown? And why do we have to then embrace the conjecture that the technological innovations of today are 
inherently less transformative than the technological innovations of 100 years ago. What could be more transformative in principle than artificial intelligence? Nothing. Uh, the second major consequence of this insularity of the knowledge economy is the aggravation of economic inequality. So economic inequality becomes then anchored in the hierarchical segmentation of the production system, in the abyss that becomes deeper and deeper and deeper between the vanguards and the rear guards, the advanced sector <coughs> and everything else in the economy. And if we now go back to the earlier discussion that what matters most is changing the primary distribution and not achieving a secondary distribution that corrects the effects of the primary distribution, the greatest effort has to be in assuring that the knowledge economy will spread throughout the economy, will become broad-based, <clears throat> and then in this way, we will diminish the division, the distance between the vanguard and everything else. So it would become like industrialization of the 20th century in terms of its breadth. If we call this industrialization, except that it's not really industry or manufacturing in a narrow sense, right? Because it applies to services right. and to agriculture yes. also. Right. right. <clears throat> now, that's then the conception of the knowledge economy. So we have this new vanguard. Unlike the old vanguard, it has maximalist rather than minimalist requirements. So <clears throat> And it can't be stereotyped. It can't be reduced to a, a near, a narrow canonical repertoire, repertoire of machines and capability. It has maximalist requirements, and we're going to explore what those requirements are for its for its spread. Uh, so, how are we then to address this dilemma? I said. The dilemma can only be fixed on the second side. We're not going to bring conventional industry back. We can only create the conditions for the spread of the new vanguard into the economy as a whole. And th those conditions seem to be of three main kinds. And this is then the argument about economic transformation. So first, it does require uh, a very high level of education. Unlike conventional industry. And we're going to discuss what this education is like later on. But in brief, you could say it's an education focused on ana the analytic and synthetic capabilities of the imagination. These capabilities can't be acquired in a vacuum of content. They're acquired in dealing with content. But what matters with respect to content is not encyclopedic scope, but selective depth. Uh -huh. Its social basis should be cooperative, teamwork, cooperation among schools, among students, among teachers. And it should be dialectical. Everything should be taught at least twice from contrasting points of view. Now, second, the moral background of an inclusive knowledge economy requires this elevation of discretionary initiative and reciprocal trust. So it's no longer a low trust form of production or a market order. And then the question becomes, to what extent is the disposition to cooperate or the accumulation of social capital susceptible to transformation? Is it a variable or is it a constant? Is it a mysterious attribute of a national culture or is it something that we can do something about? And the position that I would want to take in that argument is that it is a variable. We can influence it 
by the cooperative character of education, uh, by <clears throat> the participation of independent civil society through cooperatives, partnering with the government in the provision of public goods or public services, the argument we had a couple of weeks ago for the creation of an alternative to what I call administrative Fordism. Right. Uh, and in the institution of a universal obligation of social service. Everyone, in addition to having a place in the system of production and of skilling, participates beyond the boundaries of family selfishness in taking care of other people the only adequate basis of social cohesion. So those are the educational and the social and moral requirements. But the most important requirement is institutional or legal. An inclusive knowledge economy requires a cumulative transformation of the legal and institutional architecture and we can imagine this transformation going through a series of stages. So in the first stage, the objective is modest, to increase access to economic resources and opportunities, the resources and opportunities of the knowledge economy, to a much broader cast of economic agents. And there are two sets of agents that have special importance. The first are the small and medium-sized enterprises of the backward economy. <clears throat> the majority of them turn to a regressive model of isolated, archaic, retrograde family business. Huh? And second, the multitude of, auto of autonomous or semi-autonomous individual agents who have lost any stable connection to a business organization. And so the backward firms would have to be brought a little closer to the frontier, to the vanguard. Uh, that requires, for example, reinventing some of these technologies so that they become capable of being assimilated given the existing learning capabilities of these backward firms. And the individual agents then have to be transformed into technologically equipped artisans. Huh? So it's a lift-up operation. And it's a lift-up operation which is analogous to something that we discussed earlier in the course which is the process of agricultural extension by which the Americans in the first half of the 19th century organized an agriculture based on family scale but with entrepreneurial attributes. So it was not a subsistence agriculture, it was an entrepreneurial agriculture. And they created that by fomenting cooperative competition among the family farmers. The family farmers were independent proprietors and entrepreneurs, but they cooperated to achieve economies of scale. And decentralized strategic coordination between the government, national and local government, and the family farmer. Family farming has this unique susceptibility to a combination of climate risk and price risk, and it requires then the invention of a whole set of antidotes to this combination of risk. Price supports, food stockpiles, agricultural insurance, crop insurance, and so forth. And you have to then bring the resources of agricultural science based on the activities of the land-grant colleges to the door of the family farmer. That was the system of agricultural extension. So you have to imagine an industrial or productivist equivalent to this 19th century agricultural extension to lift up the backward parts of production. 
Then you have to discover empirically or experimentally what works, and then you have to disseminate the practices that work. Right? You have to identify retrospectively what works, and then disseminate. So let's say that all is the object of the first stage of the institutional expansion. The second is then out of that to begin to develop the architecture of a different kind of market order. There are now two kinds of models of government business relations in the world. There's the United States, the American model of arm's length regulation of business by government. And there's the Northeast Asian model of formulation of unitary trade and industrial policy imposed top down by the bureaucratic apparatus of the state. This would have to be a third model, a form of strategic coordination between government and backward business that would be decentralized, participatory, experimental. So it wouldn't be one trade in industrial policy, it would be a series of experiments conducted simultaneously by this partnership between government and business and cooperative competition among the firms. And then we come to the third stage, far into the speculative future, uh, and my thought experiment of the rotating capital auction is that we put the productive assets of society in the hands of investment funds. No one has perpetual property, perpetual or absolute claim on the resources of production. Uh, these funds are set up by the branches of the democratic government in very, well, according to various models, different time horizons, different risk profiles, and they auction off the capital resources of society, liquid capital and technology, to the most effective uses. Now, this is supposedly what an efficient capital market already does. So the exponent of financial orthodoxy would say, we don't need that because it already happens. So supposedly an efficient capital market already auctions off the resources to the most effective users. If they are not the most efficient users, they will in the long term, according to this theory, not remain in the control of those resources, right? right? But here we don't take that on trust, on faith, but we actually test it by enacting this idea as an institutional experiment. Now, we say then in this third stage, that shouldn't be the only way in which economic decentralization takes place because the traditional property right has an advantage which no other system has. The traditional absolute property right, which combines all the constituent powers of property and vests them in the same right holder, the owner, allows the owner to do at his own risk something that no one else believes in without having to negotiate with a series of people who hold rights of veto. And we would also always want to have that as part of the system of economic decentralization. But the basic idea is that a decentralized market order has no single natural and necessary form. So instead of nailing it to the cross of a single dogmatic version of itself, we allow alternative regimes of private and social property to coexist experimentally in the same market order. That's the idea. And one of those variations is the traditional absolute property right, and another variation at the opposite pole of the spectrum is the rotating capital auction, and there are many intermediate forms. That's the future. That's the institutional basis 
of what you could call capitalism without capitalists. They're not capitalists if they're not perpetual and absolute owners, but they are decentralized economic agents. So uh, the idea is that unlike conventional industry, the earlier vanguard, uh, an inclusive knowledge economy is not something that emerges automatically. Right. Uh, it's something that we have to fight for. And we have, we, we have to imagine it, and we have to create step by step. It's educational, it's social moral, and it's in legal institutional conditions. And the most important, the paramount part in this background is the legal institutional. Now, let me say just one more thing before I invite your questions and objections. This emergence of an insular knowledge economy comes together with a series of other perverse economic phenomena. And one of those phenomena is the consignment of an increasing part of the, of the labor force in every major economy in the world to radical economic insecurity. So I mentioned that the masters of the insular knowledge economy discover a way to divide the process of production into a lucrative and creative core, which they keep for themselves, and a commoditized or routinized part, which they then subcontract to firms and workers in remote parts of the world. So both at home and abroad, the formation of the insular knowledge economy is accompanied by the abandonment of an increasing part of the labor force to precarious, unstable employment. So the world of conventional industry, the world of Henry Ford, was a world in which a large stable labor force was assembled in large productive units, like factories, under the aegis of this large corporation. Now we have these businesses that are often fabulous. Right. They do no actual manufacture themselves, like the chip designers. Right. The, the chips are actually made by someone else in another part of the world. And so the, the perverse insular form of the knowledge economy comes with a new set of challenges in the relation between labor and capital, which we have to address separately. Stop. And so, how would uh, how would we reverse the very common practice of having, for example, chips or other material necessary for the uh, knowledge economy um, being manufactured? Uh, at far lower costs in other parts of the world. No, I don't think you can reverse that in any simple way. Okay. Uh, I so I think I think the, the the question is what what should be our attitude to this uh, abandonment of labor to radical economic insecurity? That's the emergency problem, right? Right. right. And so just as there are different stages. In the industrial policy, which I described, right. so there are different stages in each response to the problem of labor. Right. So now there are two discourses about labor in the world. There's the syndicalist discourse right. of the labor unions of the labor leaders, right, which want to prohibit by decree all the new forms of production. Right. Uh, right. And say that there are fraudulent circumvention of the labor. And there's a neoliberal discourse, which under the slogan of flexibility, then, abandons the majority of labor to radical economic insecurity. So <clears throat> the emergency problem is to recognize the inevitability of some of these new practices in relation to production flexibility, but to not allow economic legitimate economic flexibility to 
turn into the dangerous and illegitimate cheapening of labor because the preservation of an upward tilt to the return to labor is one of the practical economic requirements of radical innovation. Right. 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 If labor is cheap, if labor is almost costless, right. innovation becomes impossible. Right. Right. That was the lesson of the slave economy. That's right. Innovation For example, we would, we would have to have a sliding scale and say, we will seek to represent and organize these workers, but to the extent that we cannot represent them or organize them, or so long as they are not represented and organized, there will be direct intervention, legal intervention in the employment market. Right. For example, by instituting a principle of price neutrality, that work rendered under conditions of unstable or temporary employment has to be remunerated at levels comparable to the levels of the remuneration of labor rendered under conditions of stable employment. Right. Let me give just an example. Uh, it seems to me that's only the first stage. Uh, and then we have to imagine a second stage in which we seek to influence the evolution of technology. Technology has no intrinsic logic of evolution. It has the logic that we give it. Right. So as I said a moment ago, technology will always replace labor. Right. The question is whether in addition to replacing labor, it also enhances labor. Right. Uh, right. Uh, and so in the second stage, the focus becomes our collective mastery over the evolution exercise through fiscal incentives and disincentives, right. to direct missions by the state, by the government, right. in demonstrating alternative development of technology, right. and its continuation through the market, right. in the market order. Then in the third stage, it converges with the capitalism without capitalism, yeah. the rotating so that's in the relation between labor and capital. And then there's the question of finance and the real economy, right? Right. So the, the historical period in which the, the insular knowledge economy emerges is also the period of the so-called financialization of the economy. That's right. right. Which labor, instead of being required to serve as a good servant, a good servant of production, becomes a bad master. That's right. Uh, and we have these three enigmas of the relation of finance to the real economy. The first enigma is this. Under the present arrangements of the market order, the production system is largely self-financed the vast preponderance of the funding of production is generated internally in the production system itself on the basis of the retained and reinvested earnings of private firms. Some of these firms have enormous pools of liquid capital and they go to the capital markets as financiers, as customers, not to borrow money, but to lend it. Huh? <clears throat> the second enigma is that finance is largely indifferent to the real economy in good times, but becomes destructive in bad times. Financial instability spills over and depresses real economic activity. And the third enigma is that the most important responsibility of finance, which would be to fund the making of new assets in new ways, which is the responsibility of venture capital right. and of its associated forms of financing, is a minuscule part of financial activity. Yeah. In the United States, which the United States is responsible for 80% of the venture capital in the world. In the United States, all of venture capital, interpreted in a large sense, accounts for something like 0.4% of GDP. Right. It's a minuscule, it's tiny. So 
the most important activity is the activity that represents a tiny portion of financial activity. So what should we want? We should want finance to be enlisted in the service of production. Uh, and therefore, in the initial stages, to discourage those forms of financial engineering that have no colorable relation to the expansion of output and the enhancement of productivity. Uh, and encourage those that do to tap the dormant productive potential of a vast amount of capital that is, for example, accumulated in the private and public pension systems of the world putting them in diversified <coughs> portfolios to invest in the making of new assets in new, uh, in new ways. Uh, now, this is not an argument against the speculative element in finance. Financial speculation is useful because it develops information and it allocates risk. It's an argument against the dissociation of financial speculation from production. Yeah. Which is, why, which is why venture capitalism is important. Because so it, important, it, yes. It uh, inspires right. and fuels uh, production. That's right. So we have to contrast financial hypertrophy. Right. Financial hypertrophy is finance becomes bigger and bigger. It, takes, it devours a bigger per percentage of the profits of the private economy and of human talent. talent. So it's very directly. So Half of the cl graduating class of Harvard College continues to go into the, the banks, right, the right. financial organizations, right. and the management consultants right. in a vast squandering of human talent. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the patient of the talent of the nation in a predatory uh, uh, activity which bears no relation to the development of the productive apparatus. So, to take uh, concretely, um, options contracts, for example, which are the main tool of the financial market, in agricultural markets, serve to increase liquidity. Right, yes. When they were transported from commodity markets to equity markets, they were converted into devices of gambling. That's right, that's they, right. Originally presented as antidotes to gambling, they were turned around and used right. as a way to play the casino. Right. So, and there the problem is is not that there is gambling, but that the gambling is not useful to production. It's not That's useful right. to play. That's right. Useful to play. So, what should we want? We should want financial deepening. We should want finance to be enlisted in the service of production rather than to become bloated right. and to suck That's right. the life out of production for itself, That's to suck right. the human life and the profit life. So And that should be relatively easy. That's to, right. So this whole do. project then that I had summarized in this contentious and schematic form, I think I would like to believe that it should appeal to the experimentalist temper of the American. Yes, yes, uh, yes, very much so. so. An experiment, and one of the most important attributes of these arrangements is that they lend themselves to revision in the light of experience. Yes, right? yes. So what we, what we should want is that, like the liberals and socialists of the early 19th century, we affirm the primacy of structural alternatives over non-structural alternatives. But unlike them, we don't want to entrust our collective future to a dogmatic institutional formula. Correct. The most important attribute of the institutional arrangements is that they be open, that they be corrigible, yes. Yes. that they be open to a wide range of contradictory experience, and that they allow themselves to be corrected in the light of experience. That's right. So, It's not American in the sense that it acts out the consequences of the principle that the market order has no single natural and necessary form. When we act that out, we play that out, and because it gives importance to ideas, right. you can't
been acted out and we don't have the idea of it. Right. But it is American in the sense that it's pragmatic, right. it's experimental, yes. uh, it's, it's a correction of the American prophetic message. Yes. Yes. My yes. It's a correction and a, and a, in a sense, a continuation of some of the, in different ways, in different terms, of some of the American prophets, economic prophets. Yes, but Henry Ford would detest it. No, he would. <laughs> he would detest it vigorously. Uh, I mean, one of the things that... So, so, going back to where we started this class, John, I think the uh, premise is this. That, so here you have the imagination of an alternative. Now, the proposition that I want to defend is that the, the interpretation of American history and the American present looks very different if you believe that there is such an alternative now. Right, right, you know? right. So it's not just that what we learn about American history informs the alternative. It's that the idea of the alternative that informs our interpretation of the present. That's exactly right. Because otherwise, <coughs> we can be tempted to accept the, the notion of the American progressives and to see all of American history as a run up to the civil rights legislation of the late, right. late 20th century. Uh, and to think that uh, Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal is the model of progressive reform, yes. except for the fact that it sacrificed the interests of the labor unions yes. and of the blacks. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. I mean, in a sense, a better model was the one that um, uh, the Homestead Act that Lincoln passed That's right. before he died, which was much more inclusive. Um, and which was trying to save something from yes. the from the dream of Tocqueville's America. Yes. Right? Yes. Tocqueville's America, where basically every white man worked for himself right. rather than for another white man. Right. But that was a system that was wedded to the 19th century form of petty bourgeois life, right? Yes. Yeah. The individual, the small scale individual entrepreneur. Right, right. So, how can you have a society in which that form is no longer sufficient? Because there has to be scale, there has to be cooperation, but preserve nevertheless the impulse of radical decentralization and experimentalism. That's the question with which we're wrestling here in both the discussion of the economy and the discussion of politics. Right. But one of your points is that in expanding the knowledge economy, um, you highlight the crucial role of the imagination in doing so. Absolutely. Uh, and, we come, and we come to this principle that, that is, is argued out at the end of this conversation, which is both, both Karl Marx and Keynes, yes. Marx in the introduction to the critique of the Gotha program, and Keynes, in his essays on economic possibilities for our children, believed that they or we are on the eve of the overcoming of scarcity, right? right. And that when we overcome scarcity, we'll be able to escape the hateful burden of work. Now, I think both these <laughs> propositions are false, yes. that Marx and Keynes believe. Yes. We're not on the eve of overcoming scarcity. Scarcity is endlessly reproduced in new forms. Uh, and on the other hand, it's not true that work needs to be a hateful burden. Right, right. That we can aspire to freedom in the economy and not just freedom from the economy. Right. And we, by transforming nature, by transforming the world, we transform ourselves. Right. Uh, so this is a higher ideal of the Enlightenment. Yes. Huh? Yes. Uh, and this whole discussion of how do we turn the insular knowledge economy into an inclusive knowledge economy? How do we make finance serve production rather than allowing it to serve itself? How do we make labor that is flexible free yes. 
flexible but free. Right. Those discussions are all part of this. Yes. Those, and on this, the future of the country and the world turns. Yes. And you also point out in an expansive knowledge economy and in the narrow knowledge economy of today, each worker has a lot more autonomy and is charged with more imagination. You refer to it, you liken it to a special forces in the army. That's right. So the you know traditional um, uh, a traditional uh, uh, military unit is a rigorous hierarchy. There is the general. Or there's, the com there's a combat plan which is issued from above. Yes. And it's rigidly executed yes. in the field. Yes. In the special forces operation, the plan is reinvented as the yes. combat. The combat, and and that each each individual, there are right. small units. There are sometimes five to seven yeah. uh, member units, but each person has considerable autonomy. And uh, now, I think that if if we think of just the legal and institutional parts of this argument, they all go back to something that was said at the beginning of the course. If you take the idea of a market and take it at the most abstract level. Even at the most abstract level, the idea of a market has at least two dimensions. One is the dimension of the absolute level of decentralization, that is, the number of economic agents who can bargain on their own initiative right. and for their own account. Right. And the second is the absoluteness of the control that each of those agents has over the resources at his command. Right. Is it perpetual? Is it unlimited by its effects on other people and so forth? And the orthodox theory of the market, market fundamentalism, thinks that these two dimensions go naturally and necessarily together, but they don't. In fact, they contradict each other. And one of the ways in which to deepen economic decentralization is to relativize the absoluteness of the control. Right. And that's what's happening in some of these proposals that we've been discussing for right. right. our two hours a day. That's right, that's exactly right. Are there any questions? Let's hope for lots of questions. There should be lots of questions. There's a lot covered. Uh, Reread the knowledge economy. It, uh, it's, it's actually, it's magisterial. It's filled with, I mean, uh, Virtually every page has insights, um, and it's a it's a, a magnificent um, template uh, and uh, template and uh, architectural blueprint <laughs> for a transformation of the economy and culture. Well, next week we discuss democracy. Right. Next week we discuss, dis discuss democracy. Yes. Um, we will see you then.